All right, let's get stuck in the Scripture today. Final week in Titus. Let me read it for you. We'll pray and then we'll ask God to help us. Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God appeared, uh, God our Saviour, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that, having been justified by grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone, but avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels and disputes about the law because they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a divisive person after a first and second warning. For you know that such a person has gone astray and is sinning. He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me in Nicopolis because I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey so that they will lack nothing. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works for pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. All those who are with me send you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with all of you. That's a full chapter. We're going to break it down, see what... Paul was saying to Titus and what it means for us today. Let's pray. And again, Lord, we need your help. And so as we think about these things, meditate on your scriptures, please help us to have open hearts and minds to you today. Help us to be attentive to your Holy Spirit as you speak to us, as you specifically show us uh, your love for us, commands that we see here in, in your scriptures, a plan and purpose for us, and more of your character, your goodness, your love. Help us in every way to gain the mind of Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, there's a couple of different ways you could approach this chapter. You could look at it and say, well, here's Paul saying, <clears throat> live like this, don't live like that. Here's the good life. Here's the foolish life. Uh, it'd be very easy to kind of realize. He gives a list over here, gives a list over there. And he goes, let me add more to this list over here. Let me add more to this list over there. And so you might say it's pretty basic, standard kind of advice. Hopefully, not much in there was particularly surprising to you. Like be kind. Um, avoid fighting. You, you wouldn't expect Paul to say, make sure you're never kind and get into lots of fights. But Paul's saying we're motivated or propelled by something much more than just living a good life or even just being a good person. What does a good life look like? I do want to actually have a look through those lists because Paul writes them for a reason and they're in Scripture for a reason for us. So to look at uh, what does it look like to live the good life and what is the thing that propels us into that kind of life? He starts off with saying, submit to rulers and authorities God has established. So he knows he's finishing the letter. Uh, we've read a bunch of stuff already about what it looks like to submit to authorities. In fact, in about a month or six weeks, we're going to be uh, starting a new series looking at our culture around us um, and some of the things that culture is saying or some of the, the pressing points in our culture at the moment. So we're actually going to spend a whole week looking at what is our responsibility as individuals, individual Christians, and as a corporate gathering, as a church, what's our responsibility to our government? Uh, there's been a lot of, let's say, division or consternation in the last, just pick a random number, three years, say, uh, about what is the relationship between citizens and government and what is our relationship as Christians to our government. So we're going to spend a whole week looking at that. So I don't want to kind of skim over this when he says, submit to rules and authorities God has established. We actually looked at this a few weeks ago. 
that we submit to rulers and authorities that God has established. So we need to firstly admit or acknowledge that they are established by God. And they are primarily, or at least established, for our good, for our safety. And that we do have a duty to submit to them uh, while they are working in their God-given authority. So we're going to, again, we're going to look at this in a couple of weeks. Being obedient to the authorities, to the Holy Spirit, to be ready, he says, so to be prepared, to not be lazy. Uh, the, the picture of this is to have um, loins girded. So if you're wearing a robe or something like this, actually pick up the, the dangly parts of the robe so that you can actually run. You can get ready to go. You don't have a bunch of steps you need to take before you can actually go and take action. You're ready for action is what he's saying. Be ready. Be prepared. Ready to help someone in need. Ready to, ready to give an answer for the hope that you have within you. And even ready for death. He says, slander no one. Slander is to bring injury to someone's reputation or dignity or honour. He's not saying don't tell the truth. He's saying don't bend the truth to make someone look worse than they are in order to damage their reputation, their dignity or their honour. Or only mentioning something about a third party, even if it's true, only in order to damage their reputation, integrity or honour. If it's for something else, you know, safety reasons or and we actually need to do something about this, then uh, that's, that could be just truth-telling. But he's saying we need to not slander anyone. <clears throat> now, he's already mentioned authorities. And so there's a little bit of an echo here where uh, in Australia, we are very good. In fact, we have perhaps created a virtue out of slandering authorities where we kind of, you know, it's a wink and a nudge. And, uh, and that's what we do. We slander authorities because they're not really people, right? They're politicians. Paul doesn't let us off that hook. He says, avoid fighting. Pretty self-explanatory in the context of Christian community and our relationship with people outside the Christian community. But it, it doesn't and can't mean avoid all fights. Paul walks right into many fights. It's not that he's going looking for the fights, but sometimes the fight is the thing in the way to where God is leading you. I just spoke with Howard before, actually. He said he was at an um, uh, intensive this week at Bible College, South Australia, and the thing that stood out to him most was how the early church had to fight for unity and fight for correct theology. There's some fights we must engage in. He's saying, don't be quarrelsome. You need to fight. Sometimes you need to fight. You've got to fight for your family. You've got to fight for your holiness. We must fight for the vulnerable who can't fight for themselves. You've got to fight for unity. You've got to fight against the powers and principalities in the spiritual realm. There are a bunch of things that Scripture commands us to fight for. He's saying don't be that antagonistic person who goes looking for unnecessary fights. Don't be the guy who's always looking for what's wrong, always on the hunt for what's bad. Uh, or the person who's known for being unnecessarily contrarian all the time. That's what he's saying. Be the person of peace. Because sometimes you need to fight. He says, be kind. Not nice. He says, be kind. Sometimes the circles of nice and kind, sometimes they overlap. Sometimes they're not touching at all. Kindness is something that's uh, both commanded and encouraged in Scripture. It's a descriptor of Jesus that he was kind. It's a fruit of the Spirit, meaning if you are filled with the Spirit, you, the fruit of that will be kind, you'll be kind. Do you know niceness is not one single time commanded or encouraged in Scripture? Never said of Jesus, he was a nice guy. We need to untether our ideas of nice and kind so that you can be kind always, even when it's not time to be nice. And if you're being kind, and someone says, you're not being very nice, we're not being very kind, you can perhaps help them uh, to say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm actually trying to be kind, even though 
it doesn't feel nice at the time. Kindness is necessary. Niceness is not a biblical category. I'm not saying don't be nice. I'm just saying make sure you're being kind. It says be gentle. <clears throat> and as with kindness, being gentle doesn't mean to be weak. This is, again, a descriptor of Jesus, that he was gentle. It means to be capable yet calm. You can only be gentle if you have an excess of strength. If you don't have an excess of strength, then you're just being normal. Or even if you're trying to be uh, powerful, if you're trying to be overbearing, but you're not capable of being overbearing, you're not being gentle just because you can't be. Gentleness requires strength that is constrained. It's like engaging with someone uh, with less capacity or strength than you. You're up here. Being gentle means to come down to their level and use whatever leftover strength there is to help lift them up. That's what it means to be gentle. Jesus, who has the power to create galaxies with his words, who had very fierce, unnice things to say about some of the religious leaders in his time, the one who went in with a whip to whip people out of the temple, he was gentle. He was kind. Paul says, what else is the good life? Are those who are heirs with the hope of eternal life so that they are the people who live as people who are going to live forever. That's what it means to live the good life in light of eternity with the hope sharing in the inheritance of Jesus that we would live as people who would live forever. How does it change how you live today when you know you're going to live forever? We'll come back to that in a minute, actually. It says, devoted to good works, not just living for ourselves so that our future is sorted, um, not a slack kind of ad hoc approach, like I'll, I'll get to good works. If, you know, one, if a good work kind of stumbles across my path, then for sure, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll consider it. If there's nothing better to do or if I have extra money at the time or if I'm, not, if I'm not too busy or subject to a better offer or if I haven't had a really big day or whatever. No, he says, we're devoted to good works. He mentions this later as well. We'll come back to it. He says, avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels and disputes about the law because they're unprofitable and worthless. This was happening at the time. This is still happening now. Christians, man, they... We double down on things that really don't matter. We're very good at promoting uh, not just secondary, like secondary doctrines, or even tertiary doctrines, but things that actually don't matter. We're really good at going, well, uh, I'm going to bring this up to the level of importance alongside the gospel. And if you don't agree with me, we're going to at least have to discuss it and argue about it. Um, and if we can't agree, then we're going to, Separate. He says, no, no, you've got to avoid that. It's worthless. It is not worth your time. It is useless, he says. Unprofitable. He said we'd, we had to be devoted to meeting pressing needs. So again, like being devoted to good works, on the hunt for opportunities. Not just letting them come to you. Not just seeing what happens along the way, but being on the hunt to be generous with your home with your money, with your time, with your talents, with your emotional energy, and with your life. That we go looking for opportunities to meet pressing needs because there are pressing needs everywhere. And we live in a culture that doesn't like to let our needs be made known. And we're living in a culture where a big chunk of people who call themselves Christians and churches say that, or at least they have succumbed to a form of prosperity gospel that says, if God loves you, your life's going to be awesome. And you're going to be healthy, and you're going to be wealthy, and all will go well with you. All of the, green, all of the lights will turn green just as you get to them. And because some people start to believe this, it kind of seeps its way in, even though we know it's foolishness. We go, well, I can't let people know I'm struggling because then they'll think God doesn't love me. Or then I'm admitting God doesn't love me. Oh, man, 
there was a, a woman who uh, came to see the light um, for, for a while. She was visiting from overseas. She had uh, cancer that would end up killing her. But because she believed this lie, she wouldn't even, she wouldn't go to a doctor or let anyone sp- even speak about it. Because that would suggest, well, no, that means I'm not trusting in God because God's promised me this healing that didn't come in the form that she was looking for. Uh, It's foolishness. It's hurtful. We need to let our needs, we need to make our needs known. We talk about this all the time here, Galatians 6.2, like bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, which means we need people who are on the hunt looking for burdens to be born when they have capacity, remember the extra strength. And we need people to, to have needs to be met. We can't fulfill the law of Christ. We cannot do what he's commanded unless we both have people who can meet needs and people who have needs to be met. You're not a drag on the community when you have needs to be met. We need you. We need needs. You're not burdensome in the sense that you're dragging people down. Uh, You're burdensome in the positive sense that we need burdens to bear burdens to put the love of Jesus on display. Don't think, well, okay, I'll go looking for more burdens because there are plenty of burdens. We need them to be made known. You need to jettison any vestiges of prosperity or health or wealth gospel, which is no gospel at all. It's foolishness. Just be fruitful. Seeing the Spirit at work in your life, seeing the love of God, the joy of God, the peace of God, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, Self-control, being fruitful, full of fruit is what it looks like to live a good life. Discipling people in Christ-likeness, bringing God glory with your life. This is how Paul starts to paint the picture for Titus. In, in his final greetings, in his like, I'm, I'm about to say goodbye, this is what the good life looks like. And then he contrasts it. He says, what does a foolish life look like? It looks foolish disobedient, deceived. So thinking that it's right, but it's actually wrong. Enslaved by various passions and pleasures where we think we are the masters of our passions and our pleasures. What actually happens, maybe not at the very beginning, but certainly over time, we as humans have this amazing ability to become ensnared by things that were at one time good or helpful or fun or even that have been like gifted by God for our good, and yet we are great at twisting them and making them the, the ultimate thing in our life, or the thing that actually decides where we go or can't go, what we do or can't do, what we can spend our money on or don't spend our money on. Uh, we're very, very good at creating these kinds of idols. Paul says the foolish life is a life enslaved, like chained, tethered to, bound by, Passions and pleasures. He's not saying don't have pleasure in life. He's not saying don't have passion in life. He's saying we must be, again, the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, we must be the ones who are the Lord, the Lord's over our passions and pleasures, not that let them lord over us. Foolish life lives in malice and envy. Someone who looks at someone else's life and goes, oh, I want that. I bet they only have that because they're cheats or crooks or... Insert whatever here. Hateful, detesting one another, engaging in foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, disputes about the law because they're unprofitable and worthless. It says also he is divisive. The one who is arguing over these things, who is trying to pull brother from brother or sister from sister over things that don't matter. It says this person is sinning, has gone astray, is self-condemned. It's basically an inversion of the good life. It's a living for myself. It's a making uh, the categories of who I will associate with or what I consider good smaller and smaller and smaller until I'm the only one who's the arbiter of what is good and what's bad. It's the antithesis. It's the inversion. It's the opposite of the good life. And so how do we, how does Paul 
help us to understand how do we how do we see and reject and avoid living the foolish life and how do we know and ensure that we are stepping into the good life is what he says firstly we realize we too were once like this that's how he that's how he ends that thought about the foolish life he says we were like that we were enslaved to our passions and our pleasures we were foolish we thought we were right until we saw the truth of the matter we were divisive Paul's writing, he, he's saying, I was the one going from house to house, ripping out Christians, taking them to prison, killing them. So we, we were like this. But, because we don't default to faithfulness, we default to fleshliness. But, when the kindness of God our Saviour and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Here's a really wonderful few verses of Scripture. It says, He saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy, not according to your works, according to His mercy. This is one of the, I think, one of the most difficult things to understand about grace. Even when you receive grace, even when you become a Christian, even when you trust in Jesus, this is one of the things we've got to remind ourselves over and over and over again, lest we start to let Again, a kind of prosperity gospel will come into our life where we look at a life and go, oh, I'm, I'm unhealthy. Doesn't God love me? Or we go, well, I haven't, done, I haven't really read my Bible much this week, this month, this year, or yet. My prayer life, now it was great back in the day, but these days. Or you might say, like, Paul, I, I'm, um, I just can't, seem to do the things that I want to do, but I am doing the things I don't want to do. Maybe God doesn't love me anymore or we feel like we're further and further away from him because of our activity and actions and then we're reminded, Paul reminds his spiritual son Titus who he loves. He says, remember, you were saved, you were loved, not according to things that you have done, good things even, bad things, but according to his mercy. It's actually the most, the most wonderful truth that God doesn't treat us according to our works. Then We don't have to try to stack up our good works. We don't have to try to project a life to everybody else that looks like we have everything in order. We don't have to do that. That's not how God looks at us according to our, you know, our pile. Even if it's a very little pile, even if it's a huge pile, if you can hide all of your deficiencies and failures and flaws and sin somehow from people, we can't hide them from God, but he doesn't treat you according to your works. He treats you according to his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want to insist on these things so that those who believe God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. So let's just quickly track through that. He says, but, but, we were once foolish, once foolish, but God's kindness has appeared. We lived in the dark, but now we're in the light. Jesus came for us. Jesus came for us. Didn't leave us in our foolishness didn't leave us in our divisions, didn't leave us in our selfishness, didn't leave us in our self-righteousness or our sin. He came for us. He has appeared. Secondly, showing his love for us. So again, the Father doesn't love you because of Jesus. The Father sent Jesus because of his love for you. Again, this is one of the most important things to wrap our head around. We've not found some sort of cosmic loophole where we go to God the Father and say, well, now you have to love me because I put my trust in Jesus. As if he's some terrible father or absent father or negligent father who doesn't actually want a relationship with you 
but because of this cosmic loophole we found, no, he has to. That's not, that's not it at all. He already loved you. Even, even us in this room. Yes, Titus, and those people that Paul's writing to Titus to tell, but also to us. He loved you even before your great, 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 great grandparents were born. He had already sent Jesus because of his love for you, according to his mercy, not according to how you feel today, not according to when you last read your Bible, although I encourage you to read your Bible, not according to when you last prayed, although I think it would be really helpful to get into a good discipline of prayer, but according to his love. He loves you. Why did Jesus come? Because the Father loves you. That's why he came. And it says he saved us. We didn't do it. We didn't reach up to him and say, hey, can you please come and save us? And then he came and saved us. He did it. We don't earn it. And because we don't earn it, we don't live in fear of losing it. Because we didn't earn our salvation, because we didn't stack up our good works and say, well, here, God, find me pleasing and acceptable. But rather, we claim Jesus' perfection already. And now God's relationship with us is based not on our good works we stack up, not on the like, foolishness we try to hide, but upon Christ's perfection and finished work. That's why it's important that it's finished. Because it's done. It's not, it's not going to change. It doesn't diminish. God's love for you doesn't grow because it can't grow. It's wonderful. Sometimes we, the fear of God, we fear God that he'll stop loving us. And when we do that, we need to just again come back to the fact that he already loved us. Or we think, again, before, um, we think God doesn't really want to love us, but he has to because of the cross. Someday he'll come to his senses and realize, well, that's true for everybody else, but not for this, not for this guy or not for this girl or not for this person or whatever. But again, all that is just the deceiver trying to take you back into the darkness of not realizing how much God loves you. That's not how God, God views you. You are his beloved. You can say, I am his beloved. He sent Jesus for me. And not just for you, but for all of his people. Without any hint, hint of arrogance, you can say, uh, yeah, I, I know God loves me. Without any hint of arrogance, you can say, I know I'm going to be with God forever. Uh, new heavens, new earth or to use like the common vernacular, I can be sure I'm going to heaven. It's not a, without a hint of arrogance, because it's not about my good works. It's about Jesus' finished work. So what I'm really saying is, I trust wholeheartedly in Jesus' finished work and God's love for me. Best evidenced in the fact that Jesus came for me, died my death. He says, through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, this is worth a sermon just in its own, so we'll just quickly talk about it. Uh, he has poured out his Holy Spirit on us abundantly. It's like throughout the Old Testament, you hear, uh, you know, this person was filled with the Spirit, or this group of people were filled with the Spirit, this prophet filled with the Spirit, and then this, we start to get these promises. One day, one day, God's going to pour out his Spirit on everybody. It's going to be awesome. And not just, not just uh, like a stingy like drip, um, not with like a little dripper or, or, or something like this, but... He's going to pour it out. And we see in Pentecost, he pours out his spirit. And then every believer, filled with the spirit. It's only by the spirit we can say, Jesus is the Lord. It's only because of the spirit in us, regenerating our hearts, that we can actually lay hold of the faith with which to receive that grace. The washing of regeneration and renewal. So the washing means we were not just not just we did sin before, but we we were sinful. We were sin, and now we are pure. Our account once had an insurmountable debt, but now we are rich with every spiritual blessing. Before we were stained, 
No matter how much in our own effort we tried to wash that stain out, we could not remove it. Now, made white as snow. Before we had shame. And now we have glory. Regeneration means, again, death to life. Kingdom of darkness, now kingdom of light. And renewal means to be made new, made whole, no longer as you were before, but now ever increasingly like Jesus. Why has he done this? He tells us, so that, having been justified by grace, we are heirs with the hope of eternal life. So not only does God love you, not only does the kindness of God appear in Jesus and save us, regenerate us, bring us back to life, wash us pure, make us whole. But then he also includes us in his family and gives us the inheritance of Jesus the Son. What's coming to him is what's coming to you. Again, this is not something that we say arrogantly. We didn't achieve this. We didn't reach up for this. We didn't stack up even our collective works to get there. Jesus has done it. And he invites us into union with him. This is the most wonderful, wonderful news. And now it's where Paul says, now that we have this hope, Paul insists that we who have this hope are careful to devote ourselves to good works, to living the good life that he just spelled out before. So good works which are good and profitable for everyone, he says. So first he says, be careful. So don't assume that's going to happen. Don't be frivolous about it. We need to be intentional with it. Make time to make it happen. Be careful. Take care that you do this, he says, to devote. Again, not just a day here or there, not just a short-term project that I'm, you know, now I've satisfied it and, and, and now I'm done for the rest of my life. Um, not half-heartedly, but with every effort. Have you ever been devoted to something or someone? What does that even mean to be devoted? That's what Paul is talking about here. To orient your life in this singular direction and go wholeheartedly for it. Single-minded. Fixed attention is what he's saying. Be devoted to living this kind of life. And then he says, uh, where is it? Be careful to devote ourselves. So the ourselves to good works. We're very good at outsourcing our good works. Especially as Australians, we outsource, I would suggest, most of our good works to the government. Where we say, well, the government will take care of that. The government will take care of the poor. Government will take care of the sick. Government will take care of the elderly. Government will take care of the, the vulnerable. The government will do the good works. And then we will try as hard as we can to pay as little tax as possible to fund it. Uh, but what Paul's saying here is, that's actually us. We're sort of devoting ourselves to these good works. We are the ones who are saying, well, actually, I'm not outsourcing, I'm not delegating, I'm taking responsibility for these good works. Not just to be around good works that are happening, but to be myself personally participating in those good works. It says, let those who are so overjoyed with newness of life in Jesus, uh, we who ill-deservingly share his inheritance and eternal life, we who have the knowledge and love of God live the good life being devoted to good works. He's not saying that those good works will earn you eternal life. He's saying you who have eternal life do good works. He's not saying those good works will get you God's love. He's saying you who God already loves, devote yourself to good works. He's not saying you're going to get closer to God. He's saying for you for whom God is imminent, devote yourself to good works. There's no sense of climbing any kind of ladder. No sense of, uh, you know, karmic scales. No sense of working yourself up to God. You are in God, in Christ already. As such, devote yourself to living this kind of life. Not to earn what you already have, but because that's what people who are in Christ do. Because it brings God glory. Because it puts the gospel on display because it highlights the love of Christ to those we're serving. 
because of what the Spirit is working in us and outworking through us, and because we want to be fruitful and not foolish. So we need to devote ourselves, carefully devote ourselves to good works. And then Paul finishes the letter to Titus uh, with basically a, a specific example of this very thing. He says, When I send Artemis, a Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me in Nicopolis because I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey so that they will lack nothing. So Paul doesn't just care about the church organization, but he does care about the church organization. So that in chapter one, he doesn't just care about Titus doing a good job and being a good leader, but we know that he does care about that because we've read that already in the letter. But he loves this disciple. He wants to see him. It's, this is not just a, 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 like a, a rule book. This is a letter written uh, with the love of a father for his son saying, I really want to see you. Please come and visit. And in the meantime, make sure you seek to meet the needs of other Christians who you come across. He finishes the letter by telling Titus to make sure all the Christians are devoted to good works and then gives Titus a couple of good works to get about himself because that's what people who are in Christ do. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for the ones that are hard to receive. Thank you for the ones that are easy to receive. And for all of them, Lord, please help us not just to hear them, but to do them. In the power of your Holy Spirit, we want to be fruitful. We want to be people of love and joy and peace, patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. People who put the love of Jesus on display for a watching world, people who will fight for holiness, fight for our family and our church family, people who will fight for those who can't fight for themselves, but not people who fight each other uh, quarrelously, foolishly. But we want to live that good life, not the good life as painted by our culture, but the good life as painted by your scriptures, as painted by your character as painted by your people throughout the generations. And so help us to live this way likewise. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, we just again acknowledge we don't deserve any of this goodness. We deserve your wrath and your judgment. But according to your mercy, you've loved us, treated us not according to our works, but according to Jesus' works. And we're so thankful. You've, you're such a good father. You're so good to us. So help us to live as people who have your love. Help us to live as people who are already saved. Help us to live as people who will live forever. Help us to become like Jesus, in whose name we ask. Amen.